Hello, everyone, and huge thank you for joining us today for a lively discussion on transforming the relationship between engineering and security in our organizations. This is a lead dev webinar created in partnership with Stackhawk. So the webinar is going to last roughly 45 minutes, and we'd love to answer whatever questions you have. So please do submit them. You'll see a Q&A button right here in Zoom. So feel free to post your questions in Zoom. And we'll have some time at the end to, uh, to answer a couple of them live or if I find them during the panel itself. Otherwise, um, if we don't get to answering your questions live, then please join myself and the panelists afterwards in the Lead Dev Slack. Um, we'll answer your questions there in the Effective Teams channel. So look for us there and we'll get a chance to continue our conversation. So let's get started with some introductions. My name is Nimisha Astagiri, and today I'm joined by Stevie Dieter, Mike Stonkey, and Jeremy Goldsmith. Um, and um, I'll go ahead and ask each of you to br please briefly introduce yourselves. Stevie, let's go start with you. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you very much. My name is Stevie Dieter. I'm the principal software engineer at DexCare. We're a platform as a service for intelligent routing in healthcare. Uh, and uh, prior to that, I was a consultant for several years. So I've worked in a variety of industries with a wide range of security concerns. So I'm very excited to learn from my fellow panelists and share what I've learned. Hi, I'm Mike. Uh I work at Circle CI. I'm the vice president of engineering there. Um, I have the security teams rolling up through me, and at my previous jobs, I have as well. I got I start early on in kind of a compliance and security role, and then moved more into uh, development practice over the years, and so I've been able to apply that uh, across that entire time. I was also been an author of the State of DevOps report for the last several years, uh, mostly brought to you from Circle CI and Puppet. Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Goldsmith. Uh, I'm the head of engineering at Stackhawk. Um, we're an application security uh, testing and automation company. Um, uh, I've got um, 20 years or so in SaaS software, mostly leading uh, software engineering teams at uh, small companies and, uh, and large. Um, um, and uh, so my perspective mostly comes from leading engineering teams. And now that I'm in the security space, uh, uh, learning about uh, great ways to kind of bridge the gap between security and engineering. Happy to be here. Awesome. Um, and for myself, very quickly, um, in my past career, I've had uh, the opportunity to um, to lead a security team um, in a company that a startup that was focused on uh, building security from the from the ground up. Um, but later on, then I, I I worked as a director of engineering and also head of architecture. But at a company where security wasn't our primary goal, but it was something that we wanted to ensure privacy and security uh, for our customers as we worked on other development efforts. So hence, that's why we're here today of just balancing these two. Um, and so to frame the conversation, I wanted to share, right, in 2020, more than 22 billion records of confidential personal information and business data were exposed. This is coming from Tenable's Threat Landscape Retro Report. And the surface of cyber attacks are only going to continue to expand, right, in the industry. Uh, last week, we had re the reInvent con conference, and there, Amazon CTO talked about the Anywhere cloud, right, with computing expanding to the edge with IoT devices and maybe even and shifting to space. It's already happening. So it's more important than ever to protect our businesses, to protect our customers. But at the same time, our software developers, right, they have a lot to juggle while they're trying to deliver on time and, and for the business outcomes. So Stevie, let's start with you. You have extensive experience, right, leading teams through the entire development lifecycle in multiple industries. What problems do you see today and how security concerns are addressed in software development? Uh, yeah, I think the primary fundamental issue is when security is treated as an afterthought or as a drag on development instead of a first class citizen. So. Um, you get really excited about the new features you're going to create, you want to delight your customer, so you get really focused on how you actually implement your functionality and you're not thinking about how am I going to get this into production, how am I going to make sure that everything is secure from start to finish, how am I going to make sure that I've done 
all of the background work that is necessary to actually make sure that all of those parts can be delivered in time. So, um, and then the, sort of the side part of that is the then having to do security reviews and it being treated as something adversarial and something that slows you down and prevents you from doing the things you wanted to do instead of something that is really fundamental to the work that you're doing, that you, it's not only delivering features, but delivering them in a way that everybody uh, can be comfortable and happy and uh, use them in a safe and secure way. So that's sort of where I would fundamentally start is um, how do we get out of that mindset and start to think about security as a first class citizen and always in our development from, you know, the simplest web app to entire systems. Excellent. Awesome. So yeah, building it in, not being an afterthought and yeah, capturing it. And so really security built in. Um, Mike, you've been a co-author of the State of DevOps report, as you were mentioning for many years. And in this year's report, it was saying how elite performers you know, who met or exceeded their reliable targets were twice as likely to have security integrated into their software development process. Um, and also like teams who integrate security practices throughout their development processes are 1.6 times more likely to actually meet or exceed their organizational goals. So can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, how does one build in security into the software development lifecycle? Well, I think a lot of it comes from making sure the right thing is the easy thing. Uh, if you if you have to go through security every time and you want to work around security, I mean, I bet, I bet, you know, as Stevie was talking about, there can be an adversarial relationship or it can be, oh, this is just a gatekeeping function that prevents me from getting my best work done. Whereas if you can make it automatic and you can make people, you know, kind of do the secure thing because maybe you have pipelines, you have secure checks, you have it built into the SDLC from the ground up people kind of don't think about it that way. They just think it's part of delivering software versus the secondary step or this, this adjunct gate that you have to go through. And what we see a lot is that the, the teams that kind of have refined their technologies, refined the building blocks they use, the people that have maybe optimized more towards self-service or platform usage can put those checks in the pipeline. And so like whether that's delivering, you know, you can validate, okay, we, we're doing static analysis or we're doing some threat model detection or we're doing well-known vulnerabilities or we're doing dependency updates. You know, there are eight or 10 different types of security checks that, you know, you can basically buy off the, tel- off the shelf tools for in a lot of cases at this point. And then there's more advanced ones where you can put in kind of your own domain logic and things like that. But the key is, is that automatic? And if it's happening automatic, people don't get mad at robots when they tell them their stuff is broken. They do get mad at people when they tell them they can't deploy. And I think that's really the difference. So if you can just make the right thing, the easy thing, that, that's going to get you the furthest gain. Now, that's not necessarily saying it's easy to do that, but it, it does mean that that's probably where, where you should really just concentrate and spend some time. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're lucky to have um, Jeremy with us here, you know, from Stackhawk, um, you know, one of the uh, he's part, he's head of engineering and, and helping build those, um, those robots, as you mentioned. So, uh, so Jeremy, like your company, Stackhawk, you're providing automation tools to build in application level security testing um, into the pipelines, you know, as Mike, what Mike was mentioning. So can you tell us a little bit more of what's working for your customers and what's not? What are you seeing? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, you know, so Stackhawk is a, a dynamic application security testing tool that, um, that helps developers find and fix vulnerabilities in their software before they deploy to production. That's really our, our mission and, and really helping to, to um, help organizations shift that security testing to the left. So it's something that developers can um, automate in their CI CD pipeline, discover and fix um, early um, uh, uh, with less cost to the, their organization and less risk of having vulnerabilities out in production. And I think that's where we see customers who really um, adopt that kind of shift left mindset. I know that shift left is kind of an overused term these days, but that's really what we're trying to help organizations do is move from a kind of an, a, a more legacy traditional security approach to having security and engineering be two opposing forces in the software development process to um, empowering engineers to, to make sure that they are finding and, and learning about how to fix those vulnerabilities earlier. Um, where we see customers who adopt that mindset and a, more of a partnership kind of a model between, or you could call it a, 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 ver- a trust, trust but verify approach from security. I think um, you know, we see, we see uh, a lot of success with our product, uh, helping them do that. Um, and I think 
uh, where we see um, uh, more issues is where organizations that want to take a traditional security approach of the security team owns the tools, they don't give their developers access or give them some trust in the trust but verify <laughs> approach um, to or you know help them be empowered to to learn more about um, security vulnerabilities, how to find them, how to fix them. Um, I think there's there's more challenge with um, uh, with a tool like ours or an approach like a shift left approach. So so we think this is a, a more modern approach to to addressing um, security vulnerabilities. Um, we're really excited about it, and and where we see customers who adopt that mindset, we see like tremendous uh, results um, using our product and other products like it in the space. Awesome. Yeah, I'd love to dive a little bit more on on that aspect of partnership and, um, you know, mentioned shifting left and, and changing the mindset. So, you know, changing mindsets, you know, also comes with shifting the narrative. So given the high risks of security mispractices in the industry, um, you know, we want to shift that narrative from like, well, because security told said so, and therefore we're doing it, or, you know, security team, they're just finding flaws to more maybe something like, well, how can security teams and security best practices actually make our team's products or service better? Um, and so uh, Stevie, like, I'm curious from your perspective, like what, 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 where, where have you been finding that that narrative shift or, or, or how, how to help our, your teams, you know, incorporate that mindset? Uh, yeah, so uh, one of the most fundamental things that I've found has been effective for the teams that I work on is uh, early on, you know, in everything that you have in your design reviews, in your, your PR templates, have a question about security. Have you thought about security? Is, you know, is this endpoint ex externally available? And if so, is it, ex you know, exposing any information that it shouldn't be exposing? Have you changed anything in that way? Uh, have you thought about how externally available? Always keep that top of mind in all of the tools that you use. And, um, you know, we slowly adding in, you know, I strongly agree with the bringing in tools that you can into your build pipeline. But a lot of that is the, um, again, you still want it to be primary in mind so that when you go to develop it, um, I'll, I'll sort of push back a little bit if nobody gets mad at a computer when it tells them that they can't uh, check something in. I've gotten mad at plenty of, of uh, automated systems telling me I can't do what I want to do. Uh, but helping provide that uh, feedback loop so that you can understand why a particular, you know, if you did the static analysis, why is it telling you that there's something wrong with this endpoint? Why is it telling you that there's something wrong with this library? so that you uh, can learn from that and understand that better as you go forward so that happens less often. So the tools are working with you to just sort of train, help train you as, as the person actually writing the code, how to think in these ways. And then it's also really about um, making people with expertise in security more available to your team, whether that be that you actually don't separate your development and your security teams or you have a liaison with your security team, um, that also expands to not just your own individual security team. Uh, several of us are working on platforms. We have external customers, uh, and then we also have third-party services that we might integrate with, and it's figuring out how to understand end-to-end -end what are those other people's concerns going to be so that I can prepare for that ahead of time. If I have to have, you know, if my new technology is going to require new ports to be open, how do I communicate that early to make sure that that's not a surprise for people trying to use my software? Uh, so there's, uh, it really just fundamentally comes to making sure that this is top of mind. Anytime you're thinking, okay, I need to to make this change from the way that I normally do it, there are security implications. There, assume there are security implications and then go find out how to make sure everybody understands what they are and comfortable with them. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, uh, you know, talking about that and just in terms of training our engineers and, 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 and elevating people more on that. And Jeremy, I was um, impressed by some of the uh, thoughts you had there on as well on cross-education and training. Could you? Uh, um, share that with us. Yeah, so. sure. I, I mean, I think there's definitely, it depends on the organization, but I think some of the things I've seen in my career, um, I've seen, you know, definite like gaps in understanding between engineering teams and security teams where the engineers may not be 
knowledgeable in some cases or have experience or practice at um, um, understanding certain security vulnerabilities, they're complicated, right? Um, some of them are really complicated to understand. Uh, and so um, um, they just may not have been exposed enough to those kinds of, um, how, to, how to spot those kinds of patterns in the code they're writing or in the architectures that they're designing. And I think there's an education gap uh, in a lot of places um, uh, that security experts can help fill um, and it goes both ways, right? So, and I, I, I've also seen um, security teams and, and security professionals who, who don't really have a good understanding of the, of the technology that their engineering teams are building or aren't, aren't that plugged into some of the, the pressures that those teams are under to deliver and, and um, come in as kind of a, a, a late stage blocker to progress, which I think is a, sets up that like really oppositional relationship that I, I know many of us have seen in our careers. And so, um, you know, if we can bridge the gap between security and engineering and educate each other on, um, some of it is, is technical education and some of it is, you know, organizational uh, bridge building kinds of things um, and, and get more on the same team, I think it's a, a, good, a good approach, right? So uh, if, if software engineers can know how to, um, the right patterns to follow to, to avoid vulnerabilities in their code, um, and how to spot them, um, how to automate uh, finding them, those kinds of things. Um, that's a win. Um, and I think if if security folks can can um, uh, can find ways to to um, be kind of on the same team, as it were, even though we we come at this problem from different perspectives and maybe have a little bit of healthy tension between security and engineering, I think that might be good. Um, if that results in a, a more secure software at the, at the end of the day, I think that's a good thing. But um, I don't know that uh, with the exploding growth of engineering teams that the traditional approach to security where security is, is late in the, in the software development lifecycle, if that will scale, I don't think it will. I think uh, there's a, a more modern approach here that's, that's been happening lately. So um, I think education is a really important um, thing to, to focus on for, for leaders and, and individual contributors in both engineering and, and security. And, and Mike, you're, you're, you're leading a, a team, you know, in a large organization that is, you know, accountable and for, for helping um, the organization move forward on security. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, as we're talking about like building this partnership and, and creating this empathy and having each side, you know, engineers and security learning more about each other, like what, how, how are you um, helping your own security team also under, understand this dynamic and, and what tactics do you might, might you, you know, sh uh, share with them of how, how to actually make this happen successfully? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things there. And, and one is like, I'm trying to remove any healthy, any tension, whether it's healthy or not. I want to make sure that it's a partnership and that we have the same incentives. And, you know, no, no developer wants to write insecure software, like at their heart, they, they don't want to write terrible software. They, and they know the security is part of high quality software, but they might not understand the, the, the implications of what they write or how they write it. And so, you know, how do you teach that? How do you learn? How do you help them learn that? And so for us, like, we have mandatory security training, which everybody says, oh my gosh, that's terrible. But it's a set of things where you actually have to like go through and break into software and learn how it works and figure out, okay, if I, how do I do SQL injections like this? Or how do I buffer overflow this? Or how do I, you know, uh, take advantage of an old dependency that was sitting here on this, you know, this stack, like, and most of our engineers love it. They're like, can we do more of this? And they just think it's really fun because it's, it, it's, a, it, it's thinking about technology in a way that they don't get to do every day in their day-to-day -day job. And so it's a fresh perspective. And what we found is if we can bring that collaboration forward and put it you know, kind of all over the life cycle, but those, those highly collaborative activities are the things that correlate with the strongest, long-lasting improvements in security and your security posture. So, you know, whether it's threat models or talking about bad actors or what do you do? Do you have game days? You know, do you go through and say, okay, this person's, this person's Slack account's been hacked. What do you do? 
we did that in real life. Like we just had somebody impersonate somebody else's Slack account and start asking questions. People started answering and eventually a couple of people were like, seems fishy. Something's weird here. And like, you know, we were an hour and a half into it before somebody really noticed, okay, we've got some work to do. Like, but you can make it more interesting than just, you know, here's your mandatory kind of HR provided webinar on, uh, on security that you have to click through and everybody like tries to view source to see if they can just skip to the end and, and answer the questions. Um, you, you can do better than that. And I think that's part of it is, is how do you really make security a part of what you work on and explain how it's important? And, you know, it, do I have all the answers? No, but I think I've done it better than I, than what I've seen it from the, the previous companies I worked at. So uh, we're always improving. Nice. Yeah. It feels like something you have to practice as you're talking. That's the, the thing that jumped into my mind is like, it requires work and practice to, to adopt those kinds of approaches. And, and if, if folks who are very knowledgeable about security can help, the rest of their organization practice it. I think that's a really good, good approach. Um, I, I see a lot of similarities here with how we've um, shifted things left on quality over the years, over the last 15, 20 years, how software engineers have gotten way more involved in automating testing, um, where I've, I've heard a very similar um, kind of objection from uh, leaders in, of QA teams of like, well, I, we can't trust engineers to do quality work. They don't think that way. They don't understand it. Well, it turns out we can, if we educate them, they can automate the crap out of it really and make it a lot more efficient. It doesn't mean that QA teams go away, but they change the way that they operate from doing all of the work to advising and coaching and building repeatable frameworks and enabling teams as the organization scales. Same thing with infrastructure. Like you see, we used to have teams of, of sysadmins provisioning servers all day long and a lot of us don't do that anymore. <laughs> Where engineers are writing infrastructure as code, and they're, uh, you know, it's it's really different. And I think that the technology advancements have enabled that automation to happen. I think something very similar is happening in security, where now we're getting some technology that's enabling us to to automate, um, have engineers get their hands on some of the levers here of of security testing, and and so um, you know, let's educate them so that they can do it and make our organizations more efficient. I think that's I see very similar patterns uh, uh, with with security as I do with those other areas. Yeah, that, that's if, a, if 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 any of you agree or disagree with that. Yeah, I was actually thinking the same thing as we were having the conversation about this. This feels very much like the same conversation we went through with um, uh, testing and QA and automating that. And it's sort of. Um, it really strikes me too the sense of when you start to think about that from the beginning, and you also learn how to start to ask the various questions that you need to ask. So, you know, in, in the, the QA process, you might be thinking, how do I make my stuff more testable? How do I split things up in the, the architecture so that we can test independent pieces? And in security, it also becomes you can go and have that conversation sooner with your security es experts of the, you know, I need to do this kind of authentication and authorization. How can I actually automate that so that I can test it, feel confident that it works that way that I expect it to? Um, and you can have that, you know, that same conversation if they're like, well, we, we want to put X, Y, Z controls on top of that. And you can have the conversation of do we really need that? Why do you need that? How do we work around that? Because if I can, if we can automate things end to end, then we can be confident that we didn't miss things as we go through because of the, the manual process. So it's all, uh, we have a lot of these different silos that we're slowly starting to break down and we all have a much wider uh, range of, you know, it's, it, it become, can become a little stressful when you're thinking about as an engineer, now I have to know all these different areas, but it, it's all important in order to really succeed and, and create a quality product. Right. And I think as Mike had mentioned earlier, right, so that to, 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 to really make this fun, engaging, collaborative, you know, it, 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 there, there's these opportunities for these collaborative activities like threat models and game days and whatnot. Um, and, and, you know, as Jeremy was also saying, like, just really have to put it into practice. And so, um, I, I'm, uh, Mike, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like, I, uh, you've had some thoughts also about prioritization and, you know, like, you know, as Stevie just mentioned, yes, developers have a lot to, to keep in mind and quality and infrastructure and all that. So, like, but see, at the end of the day, how are we going to actually make this happen? How are we going to ensure that security does get prioritized amongst other development concerns? Are there any tips or tricks or 
or I mean, yeah, to, to me, this is kind of the, the, the dirty secret of, of security is everybody knows what to do. They just don't do it. And, you know, it's, it's like going on a diet. You know what you're supposed to eat. You just don't. And like, so it's the same stuff, you know, and I think the other side of that is what's the cost of being wrong? If you look at the real cost of being bad at security right now, at least in, you know, capitalist uh, Western society, it's not that high. You know, like Home Depot risks, uh, you know, every every user gets compromised. Target, every user gets compromised. Uh, Equifax, every user, you know, gets compromised. What happened to any of those? Nothing. You know, they got a, a couple, you know, couple million dollar fine for billions and billion dollar companies. Like, it doesn't matter. It's, it's insignificant. It's cost of doing business. And so from that perspective, that's why it doesn't get prioritized. You have to look at it from like a total, total thing. But some people say, well, for my business, it matters more than what it matters to those. Okay, great. I hope that's the case. And if that's the case, then talk about prioritization. But, you know, if you have a process that says, hey, low, 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 you know, things deemed low risk, we can fix in the next six months. Cool. Um, maybe that's okay. But that low risk thing might be the thing that actually topples over your entire, your entire system. And so like, is that the right, is that the right risk profile? You kind of have to evaluate your own risk profile there. But I think the the key for prioritization is just, can you make it part of the way you do every other piece of work? And, you know, in a modern like software architecture, if you're deploying all the time and, and your microservices, like if you can't deploy the microservice, even with a low security vulnerability, or it'll let you do it five times, but won't you do it the sixth time or, you know, something like that. So that like somewhere in there, there's just a, Hey, we're not going to just keep letting this float by. It's not, it's not okay. We have to let, we have to put our foot down and just say, Hey, it, it's time to fix this. And, Part of that also means that those security tools that are testing and validating that are good. And I think that's another thing that like the space has been weak at for a long time. You know, a lot of times it was, we're going to do a version match on a string for this piece of software to figure out if it's good or bad. We're not actually going to validate that the vulnerability is there or not, because it could be in the way you have it configured, that vulnerability is never going to, never going to show up because you don't even have that, that part of the service enabled or whatever, but you can still get it to, you know, uh, a rejection because it's like, Hey, you're on the wrong version of the software. Or maybe you're running RHEL where they backport things into old versions of software. And so, you know, the version string is never going to be what the upstream one is. And like those tools have been the bane of developers' existence for years or operators' existence for a long time. And so there's space in those tool spaces to get better as well. But I think as long as you can make the right thing easy, prioritization isn't that hard. When the right thing's really hard, business leaders don't want to make a call of, I, I could do something that my users are asking for and, and wanting to do, or I can worry about security. Like it's just, that's just not a call they they realistically can make effectively because they don't have enough context to make it. Awesome, awesome. Um, I just want, uh, wanted to also uh, remind the participants that um, uh, you know we will have some time for for questions and answers, hopefully. So please go ahead and um, uh, enter your questions in the Q and A uh, in Zoom, and uh, I'll keep an eye out for it and see. Uh, what, what we can take the chance to answer here live. Otherwise, whatever we cannot answer here live, then we'll go ahead and answer in, in Slack afterwards. So, um, okay, great, awesome. So then I think the, relatedly, right? So I think that, uh, there, there might be some opportunities to also just think about the position of security in the organization. Um, and so that, you know, could talk, you know, we could think about the organization structure, we could think about organization design and where security is placed. We talked a little bit about shifting left in the software development lifecycle, but what about the function of security and, um, you know, the experts in, in the organization? Are there any um, uh, experiences that um, you have faced that have been successful or not successful and you've learned over the years that oh, it's better placed in this place or, or another so uh, Jeremy, let's let's start with you on on that. Yeah, I have definitely both. I think maybe the the <laughs> the the stronger example is is where I've seen it not work, um, or in my opinion, not work well. Is where security and and engineering are two completely different organizational silos in a larger company. Um, and I saw firsthand a lot of the a lot of the um, the downsides of that approach where um, the the security team was so in my case i'll just use my example of the team i was leading as an engineering leader um was working on a at a, at a large tech company was working on a cloud um cloud computing product um that was all you know virtual server virtual servers in the cloud um and uh the security team was was scanning our servers for vulnerabilities um uh and frequently my team would have to spend a lot of time 
um, running down issues that were non-issues, a lot of false positives. So um, things like uh, we found a, uh, uh, a compromised um, uh, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth driver, and we had to explain how these are virtual cloud-based servers. There's no Wi-Fi connection or Bluetooth connection going on. This is a, a waste of our time uh, to, to, to spend a lot of time solving this. Um, and really, we, we, what we were missing was someone on the security team who would spend some time with us to understand our team and our business and what we were doing. And there was a lot of activity. And I think in their organization, they saw, you know, that, well, there's tickets and there's vulnerabilities we found that need fixing and they have SLAs and we could report that up through the organization as a lot of activity. But the effort that we were expending to solve that was really not amounting to much value to the organization. And so, um, you know, I tried my best to make a case for like, hey, we could use a dedicated security person who could embed with us and help triage these issues and save our engineers from spending a lot of their precious time on this. Um, uh, but, you know, that was that was very difficult in a large organization where the silo, like the goals were misaligned, the people were not working together as much as they could. Um, it was really frustrating. And so uh, to me, that's a, a counter example of, uh, of what works well. Um, and I kind of, you know, going through that experience kind of decided like, oh, I, I, I would rather work at a company that is has more partnership between these functions. Um, but um, that's that's one of my one of my experiences where I've seen it not work well. Nice. Um, Stevie or Mike, did you have any other thoughts or anything to add to that? I mean, I think on org design, you kind of run into whatever you do with specialized engineering, you know, like with, whether it's SREs or or test experts or whatever, it's kind of, do you centralize it? Do you put them out on teams? Do you have a separate department for it? And with security, I've seen all, I've seen all of those models and, you know, hiring a security engineer for every team is probably the most effective way to do things, but probably the most expensive as well, and probably not going to get signed off on in most cases. And so then it's, how do you share that expertise? And I think to me, when you can put the security team within engineering versus kind of a separate department, totally, I, I definitely think you get better results because you get people more focused on that delivery of software versus kind of um, competing with priorities like corporate security and endpoint management and mobile device management and, you know, all the other things that really, really matter from a security standpoint, but maybe not from a software delivery security standpoint. And so you might have to have two teams. You may have to have a security that's more corporate security or IT security, and then one that's more directed toward engineering and security, um, you know, just secure practices. Um, and then the other thing that I, I think we're starting to see orgs do is kind of look at security kind of in all aspects of the SDLC. And that means runtime as well. It's not just everything before you put it into production. It's even when it's in production, you know, if your auto scaler is scaling up new new nodes, are those new nodes running a different version of something than an old node because they pulled a new AMI or they pulled a new Docker image that, you know, when you just pull latest, what does that mean? Well, hard to know. Uh, and so do you need to revalidate? And, you know, so you kind of have to get into this continuous validation mode for your security. And that's so, you know, while you talk about shifting left, it's like, it's kind of shifting left, shifting right. It's just making sure you have security coverage everywhere in the model. And that's kind of what it, what a good security org is going to figure out is like, where are those gaps and then, and then how do you address them and then share from there. But I think the setup that I've seen the best is kind of a security team within engineering to really help the engineering folks, uh, you know, keep, keep with their velocity goals and not be a gatekeeper externally. Shared incentives yeah. matter. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think the, um, one of the things is, so we're talking about a separate security organization and the placement of it, you know, building this partnership with the engineering, perhaps even placing within the engineering org as a function within it. Um, and so when we're talking about these things, and we're also talking about prioritization uh, and making sure business is seeing the, the advantage, the competitive advantage of, of this as well. Um, so, you know, that, that makes me also ask, you know, wonder about accountability and, and measuring and how do you ensure that your organization's security practices are effective um, and they're also you are being efficient with the developer velocity and at the same time um, you know so doing looking at the whole entire spectrum so accountability and measurement so what 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 thoughts do people have on that um, and whether they've um, found any good techniques or or mindsets to, to help with that um, Jeremy did you want to yeah, sure. I mean, I think I think there's there's a risk of um, 
of having some some vanity metrics here of I, I think I've seen I've seen the you know number of number of tickets um, created in a ticket tracking system for security issues uh, as as something that people can focus on. I think that's a uh, not the greatest <laughs> kinds of things to measure of you, you can measure, I think we in a lot of things in our space, you can measure activity or you can measure outcomes. And, and just because we were, we're busy doing things doesn't mean that those things are valuable. Um, and, you know, to me, um, there's definitely a risk of that with, with security vulnerabilities and, and especially around measuring activity of how many things do we have people working on? Um, um, I think, you know, some of the outcomes around um, vul vulnerabilities fixed uh, found and fixed is interesting. Um, I'm curious. I, I haven't led security teams before, so I'm curious what Mike Mike's uh, um, thoughts are on this because I think he's got a lot more uh, direct experience with measuring security outcomes. But but I do think that the measuring outcome versus activity is an important thing to keep in mind. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Mike. Mike, what's your your thoughts on this? I mean, first off, security measurement is really hard. And I think that people need to understand it's really easy to know if you're bad at it. It's really difficult to know if you're good at it. And so, because you don't know, did you do way too much? Did you do just enough? And you, you, you can't know that. And I think that's the thing that, that people need to be okay and comfortable with is if you're not having security problems, one of two things is happening. You've done everything right and your security posture is amazing. Or you have a bunch of security problems that you're not even capable of detecting. And Either of those could be true. Both could be true in some cases. So, you, you know, it, it's just hard to measure. One of the things that I, when I'm hiring security leaders, the things that I usually ask, my, usually my first interview question is, how would you know if you're doing a good job? And, you know, how do you know if, uh, if you're secure? And, you know, the people that come back with like, here's my three point plan of exactly how I know that security is working. I'm usually like, yeah, I'm pretty skeptical on this. Um, so, but others will be like, well, we have some indicators here, but you know, still overall, like there's a, there's a, like a default paranoid stance. You should probably just take in security. And, and I think that that helps with measurement, but the things that I really like to look at are, you know, just length of known known deficiencies. Like if you have vulnerabilities that you know about, how long have they been there? Like what's your risk time frame? You, you know, risks are measured in both severity, but on also in time of exposure. And like you may not be able to control the severity of a risk, but you can control the time of exposure. And so how fast can you react to that? That's a big thing. Um, and luckily that's the same thing that helps with velocity for the rest of engineering. Like if you can deploy something very quickly, that's a security feature just as much as a business feature. And so to me, that's where these incentives really start to align. And you can say, okay, we have a vulnerability. Well, let's just redeploy it. Cool. I'll do that, you know, before lunch today. That's great. Um, <laughs> and, but then you get into other, other aspects of measurement that I think are really hard. And the thing that I usually come back to is our teams willing to work with security. Like the, the thing that I want to measure is like, do you have a net promoter score with security? Do you like working with them or do you try and avoid them? Because if you try and avoid them, you're going to not use them. And it means you're overall, you have deficiencies in a lot of your more cultural side of how you're operating. Awesome. Um, and, and I do actually want to get Stevie's opinion on this as well, because Stevie as a a technical leader and you're and you're you know you're you're inspiring and motivating your team also to value this um are there um you know what, what techniques are you using there are there things around accountability or things like that that you try to bring into your teams um or, yeah i'll focus more on sort of some of the things i've seen that um i think that has made us uh a little you know more effective and things that we're learning and and I think that really learning is sort of the feature here. Like one thing that we've sort of experimented with and we, we go a little this way and a little that way is the um, embedded SRE versus the um, SRE team that we rely on. And one of the big tools that helps out there is the concept of, you know, infrastructure as code. So if we have our, you know, in, in our case, we're using AWS, so we're building stuff in the cloud. So we, you know, all of our security groups and all that stuff we want to do is all in our CFTs so that that can actually be reviewed uh, when we want to, you know, I need increased uh, permissions in order to do X, Y, Z thing. Then you can have that, that security discussion right then and there. And you have it documented. This is why we decided to make this, this change. This is why we decided to, to elevate the, the permissions on these roles. Um, so, uh, Having tools like that, which continually has those conversations going on, you know, I want to do this thing. Well, how can I do it securely? And then you can continue that. That also helps you as the engineer understand like, oh, why, oh, now I see why that's risky. That's why I shouldn't just always have 
these elevated permissions to do these things. This is why we need to log this. Um, so that's one of the sort of the, the um, from the engineering side is that continuing to uh, increase that um, awareness of all aspects of security in your software, that, uh, things like that. And then for us, um, I also think very much in terms of there's, you know, I'll bring it back to that concept of we have our own security concerns as we're building our platform, but because we are integrating as a platform for other services, it's sort of learning to understand how to uh, work with those external security teams. You're going to have an entirely different set of concerns. And how do we make sure that we can, you know, the discussions that we had about making sure they understand what we're trying to do so that, that when they do their security analyses, that uh, we can make sure that it's successful and they're not uh, being, you know, too concerned about we, that we've done our due diligence and that we can explain why we've made certain technical decisions. And that also goes to, to being um, educated as an engineer because you're going to get these questions from your third party uh customers and you're going to have to explain to them why these certain things need to be done or why it works in the way that it does. So it, it just continues to be like you have to you have to feel empowered so that you get into this, these conversations and you can speak as equals and um, have that sort of positive loop that you have with with external teams as well as your internal teams. Awesome. Um, we have a, a, a question from an attendee, which I think is very interesting. So, you know, this is coming from somebody who's in the startup phase, st stage. So, um, you know, what specific advice would you have for a junior security engineer looking to help move a startup's practices in the right direction? So, um, you know, as you can imagine, the, the, the tension there and the priorities might be very different from a large organization. Uh, and so who would like to take a stab at that. I mean, I'll say, I think, check out Stackhawk, uh, uh, but in, you know, in all seriousness, tools like ours, I think uh, when you're in a small organization, especially developer focused security tools um, is something that I think can, can, especially when you're, you're at a small place and you don't have, you know, tons of staff um, can really help. Um, and so um, I, I think that's, that's one thing to do. I'd also say, um, you know, start spending time with, as so this is a junior security engineer, um, start spending time with your engineering team if you're not doing that already. Get to know the work that they're doing and, and get kind of plugged in to what they do. And then uh, similarly, um, start um, helping to, to, to cross-train people, uh, run a, a lunch and learn about some security topics or help educate your engineering team on ways that they can adopt better practices. But um, I think trying to get into the developer's workflow um, so that they're thinking about security early and they're testing for it in the process and, and um, using some security minded uh, or I guess developer focused security tools, I think is a good, that's my advice. Yeah, I'd also that. say, um, you know, coming from being in a startup myself that um, uh, one thing in in order to sort of make it more fun if you will is the that that's a great opportunity for looking at things like game days and stuff like that because you're you're early on in the develop probably early on in your development process start to figure out ways that you can work together with your engineering teams and sort of explore how do things work um so i think that'll give both you as the up and coming engineer a better chance to really understand what technology is being built uh and then also have that that working with your engineers and getting into that cycle so that they can start to see things as you go on. So I think that would be uh, one possible technique to uh, get there. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of support what, what both my panelists, my fellow panelists have said is to me early on, like go, go into those game days or go into other collaborative activities where you can learn more about what the engineers are doing. Uh, one of the things that I might do is a threat model where you might just ask, okay, if there's a bad actor, what are they after? What do they want? What do we have? What are they really interested in that our company has? And you can start saying, well, how do you protect that? And if you can ask those questions with the engineers, you'll learn, a, even if you're a junior engineer, but you know how to ask the right questions, Those the more senior, the more tenured engineers They've seen this stuff and they're like, oh, we would protect this thing. I didn't think they were going after this, but if they were going after it, we'd protect it in this way. Or we could, you know, we, we could do service to service encryption versus and authentication versus having everything behind the firewall be open or, you know, whatever. Like there's a lot of things that people can do that 
once you start talking about why, like what a bad actor is going to do on the system, you can, you can kind of figure out where you want to prioritize because there's always going to be a hundred things you could do, but maybe there's one or two that would be very meaningful very quickly. I, as you, as you all were talking, I thought of something else that I'd add is um, I, I, maybe this person's already doing it, but I would recommend like attend, attend um, the agile ceremonies of your engineering teams, go to standups, go to planning meetings, try to understand, be visible in the organization, um, like uh, build relationships with people in engineering and, and try to understand what their, what their priorities are so that you can incorporate security related stuff into their planning and prioritization. Um, don't be an outsider to the way and the way software is planned and built, uh, like, show up and, and participate, maybe, maybe show up and listen and observe, and then start to figure out how to participate and get stuff into the prioritization. I love it. I love it. And, and so um, it's a great, actually a great uh, way to end the session. So thank you for that question um, as well. So I mean, basically, you know, building that relationship, that partnership collaborative, and it's not, it's together where, you know, creating a more secure, a better product overall for our users, for our, for your business. And um, so anyway, you all heard it here. There's a lot of uh, tips and tricks and, and experiences we can leverage from other sister organizations like quality and infrastructure, you know, incorporating that into security. The, the, the Definitely the increased need for this is evident in what we're seeing in the state of DevOps report. Um, and, you know, where in the organization does security fit in? If you're a junior or a startup, get, it, get in there. Don't wait. You know, there are some definitely basic things. It's great to put into your organization from the ground up. So I really, really want to um, say thank you so much to our panelists, Jeremy, Stevie, and Mike. This was awesome. It was great. Um, for, all, for the rest of you, please join us in Slack. Um, use that as a way to engage with these esteemed panelists um, and get more information from them. Ask your questions, whatever is on your mind, how to incorporate this in your organization or for your own career development and security as well. We need more cybersecurity specialists in the industry as well. So thank you all so much for joining us and um, have, a, have a great day. Mm -hmm.